So welcome to another Authors at Google Talk here in uh, New York. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Simon Critchley um, in his book released on humor. Uh, he comes from, uh, well, he was a professor of uh, philosophy at the University of Essex uh, and is now um, at the New School right down the street. So New York is, is uh, all the richer to have him here. Um, that, was that applause or was that a bag of chips? Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I also have his other book that um, I'm actually really excited to have in my hands because it's not even released in the U.S. yet, um, the book of uh, Dead Philosophers. This is the Australian version and coming out uh, shortly in the States, so keep an eye on his, uh, his list on Amazon. Um, without further ado, I will let him uh, kick it off and uh, talk about the book on humor. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lee, and thank you to Cameron for the invitation. <clears throat> uh, philosophy is a funny business, and philosophers are funny people. Well, some of them are funny. And the philosopher asks you to look at the world awry, to place in question your usual habits, assumptions, prejudices, and expectations. The philosopher asks you to be skeptical about all sorts of things that you ordinarily took for granted. The reality of things in the world, whether the people around you in this room are human beings or really robots. I'll leave that for you to decide. In this regard, the philosopher has, I think, a family resemblance with the comedian. The comedian also asks us to look at the world awry. To imagine a topsy-turvy universe where horses and dogs talk, lifeless objects become suddenly alive, groups of nuns take baths together, and bears engage in civilized conversation with hunters before subjecting them to unmentionable acts. And I'll come back to bears in a little while. So the philosopher and the comedian ask you to look at the world from what we call a Martian perspective to look at the world as if you'd landed from another planet, Pluto, Plato, or wherever. And with this rough resemblance in mind, I became interested in the topic of humor and wrote a book about it. It came out a few years ago. It got translated into a few languages, the last being Farsi, which is I'm particularly proud of, and I want to send a copy to President Ahmadinejad, particularly because the book is full of uh, Marx Brothers gags and other decadent Western imperialist evidence of the worldwide conspiracy of Jews and homosexuals. So I'm sure it would be welcome with the, the Iranian regime. But let me begin by considering the question, what takes place in a <laughs> joke? Um, a joke is a strange but utterly everyday practice, something we all do. But what is that thing that we call joking around? The first thing we can say is that joking is a practice. It's something that we do, and it's something that we find meaningful. Um, joking has to be something shared between the joke teller and their audience. It has to be a, a, a congruence, a congruity between the joke teller and the audience. If you like, there's a, there's a tacit social contract at work here, some agreement about the world that we inhabit. And this world is the, the background to the joke. There has to be some sort of shared understanding, some sort of consensus about what joking means for us, which linguistic routines are recognized as joking, which visual routines are recognized as joking, and the rest. Now, most jokes work through an experience of what we can call incongruity. Incongruity. This is the incongruity theory of humor. The incongruity is an incongruity between what we expect to be the case in a joke and then what takes place. It's what we expect it to be the case and what takes place in the joke. Let me give you six examples. One, do you believe in the life to come? Mine was always that. Have you lived in Peoria all your life? Not yet. Do me a favor and close the window, it's cold outside. If I close it, will that make it warm outside? Do you want to fall? Do you want to use a pen? I can't write, that's okay. There wasn't any ink in it anyway. Five, which of the following is the odd one out? 
greed, envy, malice, anger, and kindness. And <laughs> six, what'll I say? Tell them you're not here. Suppose they don't believe you. Suppose they don't believe me. They'll believe you when you start talking. It's a March Brothers game. In order for the incongruity of the joke to be seen as such, there has to be a congruity between joke structure and social structure. And when this is missing, when this social contract is missing, then laughter will probably not result, which is the, often the effect of telling, trying to tell a joke in a foreign language, which is a very difficult thing to do. Or indeed at the Google offices in New York City. Now, in, in, uh, in his classic book, Laughter, the French philosopher uh, Bergson explains what he calls the leading idea in our investigations. The leading idea is the following. It's very simple. This is quoting Bergson. To understand laughter, he says, we must put it back into its natural environment, which is society. And above all, we must determine the utility of its function, which is a social one. Laughter must answer to certain requirements of life in common. It must have a social signification. So, in listening to a joke, I presuppose a social world that is shared, the forms of which the practice of joke telling is going to play with, it's going to mess with, it's going to screw with. Joking is a game, a game that the players only play successfully if they understand the rules and follow the rules. Wittgenstein, the philosopher, puts the point perspicuously in one of his posthumous remarks. Not spoken after he was dead, but published after he was dead. Mm. He spoke out this is a trick philosophers learn how to speak. Of. In fact, his death is a very funny story, which I could, I could tell you, uh, if you like. But he says, and this is a very interesting remark, what's it like for people not to have the same sense of humor? They do not react to each other properly. It's as though there were a custom among certain people for one person to throw another a ball, which he's supposed to catch and throw back. But some people, instead of throwing it back, put it in their pocket. Right? So joking depends on me throwing you the ball, you throwing the ball back. And once we have that social contract in place, we can engage in the game of joking. If you refuse to play the game, you catch the ball, put it in your pocket, it's not going to work. Now, some anthropologists, and there's a lot of anthropological work on humor, which is fascinating, have compared jokes with rights. I mean, anthropologists are interested in humor because if you can work out the patterns of joke telling in a society, you can work out how that society functions, as it were, negatively. They compare jokes with rights, R-I-T-E-S, not R-I-G-H-T-S. A right is understood here as, a, as something that derives its meaning from a cluster of symbols, a cluster of socially legitimated symbols. Th think, of a, think of a funeral. A funeral is a rite. But insofar as the joke plays with the symbolic forms of society, the bishop gets stuck in a lift, or the communion wafer, or those nuns in the bath that I already mentioned, which I can't get out of my mind. Insofar as the joke plays with, I'll tell you that joke as well, no one laughs at that joke, it's a, it's a very strange one. Insofar as the joke plays with the forms of society, these jokes might be thought of as anti-rights. So the way in which society functions is through a series of rights, oh good lord, and um, jokes are like anti-rights. They mock, parody, and deride the practices of a given society. The Czech novelist Milan Kundera remarks, he says, someone's hat falls on the coffin in the freshly dug grave, and the funeral loses its meaning, and laughter is born. So imagine that situation where we have the rite of the funeral, people wearing their hats, the coffin being lowered into the grave. As you low, low down, the hat falls onto the coffin, and laughter breaks out. At that point, the rite becomes an anti rite and you laugh. That's often the way it works. Suppose that someone tells you um, a joke. This is an old Liverpool joke. That's where I'm from and the, uh, my, my father's favorite jokes. I never left the house as a child. My family was so poor that my mother couldn't afford to buy his clothes. Now, firstly, 
I recognize that a joke is being told, and I agree to having my attention caught in a certain way. Now, agreeing to having my attention caught is essential. If someone walks away in the middle of the joke, or turns to someone else and starts talking, this is bad form or just bad manners. The, the, the social contract of the joke playing game has been broken. So instead of throwing the ball back, I put it in my pocket. So someone begins to tell a joke, and I agree to go along with the, the joke telling game. And in agreeing to go along with the joke telling game, a certain level of tension is uh, aroused in the listener. That's why jokes use repetition, usually threefold repetition. Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman, whatever it might be. Usually groups of three, and the, the tension builds. And when the punchline kicks in, the little bubble of tension pops, and we feel something that we can call pleasure. Right? Here's an explanation of pleasure. Pleasure is the raising of tension and the lowering of tension. I laugh, or I just smile. When I was 10, my mother bought me a hat so I could look out the window. Right? Punchline to the early joke. Now, what happens here is what another philosopher, Immanuel Kant, not a great humorist himself. There were just two racist jokes in, in, in Kant's work, which I won't, I won't bore you with, neither of which are very funny. And uh, Kant says that what goes on in humor is an evaporation of expectation to nothing. So I build up expectation through repetition, Englishman, Irish, and Scotsman, and then there's an evaporation of that to nothing, and I experience pleasure. Or I experience what we call comic relief. Right? So comic relief is I experience of pleasure. Now, is that it? Is that an end to the matter? Is it just a question of comic relief? Is that all we can say about humor? This is the elevator. This is, this is right, right, right. Cameron told me about this. <clears throat> No, it's not just comic relief. There's more to it than that. Is pleasure simply the raising of tension and the lowering of tension? Something is of little consequence. I think I'll wait for this too. I want to claim something else. I want to claim that what goes on in humor is not just comic relief, but what we might call liberation or elevation. Liberation or elevation that expresses something essential to our humanity. Right? So what goes on in humor, the best humor, is a form of liberation and elevation that expresses something essential to our humanity. Now, this is a, there's a longer argument here, but to give you an idea of the thought that I'm after, there's a, there's a play by uh, Trevor Griffiths from 1976 called Comedians, which is about uh, a, a comic school in, in, in Manchester, in England. And there's a character called Eddie Waters, is explain, explains how to be a comic in the following terms. Quote, he says, a real comedian, that's a daring man. He dares to see what his listeners shy away from, fear to express. And what he sees is a sort of truth about people, about their situation, about what hurts or terrifies them, about what's hard, above all, about what they want. A joke releases the tension, any joke, but a true joke, a comedian's joke, does more, than release the, does more than release tension. It has to liberate the will and the desire. It has to change the situation. End of that quote. So a true joke, a comedian's joke, has to change the situation. So any joke releases tension and produces some pleasure. But a real joke, a true joke, a comedian's joke, suddenly and explosively lets us see the familiar defamiliarized, the real rendered surreal, the ordinary made extraordinary. And we laugh or squeal in a sort of infant-like moment of delight. Now, in my view, the, the best humor brings about a change of situation. It brings about a transient but significant shift in the way we view reality. Now, the idea of humor as a change of situation can be caught in the, the words of an English anthropologist called Mary Douglas. She says, a joke is a play upon form that affords us an opportunity for realizing 
that an accepted pattern has no necessity. So jokes play upon the forms of speech in society. They play upon the accepted practices of a society. Um, and they show that those practices have no necessity. The anti-right of the joke shows the sheer contingency or arbitrariness of the rights in which we engage in social life. So great jokes produce a feeling of contingency. We realize that the state of the, the rituals and rights that we engage in in a society are in fact like the emperor's new clothes, things that we can see through. To that extent, humor has a critical function, a really important critical function with respect to society. Hence the great importance that humor has had in various radical social movements, such as radical feminist humor. How many men does it take to tile a bathroom? I don't know. It depends how thinly you slice them, for example. As the old Italian street slogan has it, una risata vi sepalira. It will be a laugh that buries you. It will be a laugh that buries you, where the you referred to are those people in power, and in laughing at power, you bury power. Right? So the way in which you do that is by, by laughing at power, we expose its contingency. We realize that what appeared to be fixed and immutable is contingent and changeable. The emperor's new clothes. It's a sort of thing that can be mocked and ridiculed. So the best humor changes the situation and can also be politically liberating. This is the real importance, say, of satire. Right? And if you think about the situation of satire in this country over the last five years where the task of oppositional politics has fallen to satirists, it's interesting. You know? In dark times, people turn to satire, hence the importance of The Daily Show, Colbert Report, and the rest. Um, so that's the good news, right? So humor is this sort of, is comic relief, pleasure, but it's also something more. A real joke almost anxiously makes you realize the arbitrariness of the world in which you inhabit, which you inhabit, and how that world could be changed in some way. But before we get carried away, it's important to recognize that not all humor is of this kind. Uh, the, a, a lot of the best jokes are fairly reactionary and simply serve to reinforce the status quo. A little while back I talked about great humor, true humor and the rest. Um, but there's also this issue of, let's say, ethnic humor. Right? There are jokes which don't attempt to change the situation but which attempt to buttress the situation. Most humor is uh, based on recognition. Right? A funny thing happened to me on the way to Walmart. Right? You begin a gag that way. You know what Walmart is, maybe you've gone there, blah, blah, blah. So most comedy is simply comedy of recognition, which often, most often simply seeks to reinforce the status quo and doesn't seek to criticize or change the situation in which we find ourselves. This is humor which can sometimes reverse social hierarchies in a rather pleasing way, but not in a very radical way. Think, for example, of P.G. Woodhouse, uh, the world of, of Jeeves, where the butler gets all the best gags, but this is no, as it were, revolutionary subversion of the order of English aristocratic society. It's, the, it's, it's, it's a pleasing inversion. Um, more egregiously, much humor seeks to confirm the status quo either by denigrating a certain sector of society, as in, say, sexist humor, or by laughing at the alleged stupidity of an outsider. Uh, ethnic jokes usually work by the identification of a stupid outsider, and you laugh at the stupid outsider. The British laugh at the Irish, the Canadians laugh at the Newfies, the Swedes laugh at the Finns, the Germans laugh at the, laugh at the Ost Frieslanders, the Greeks laugh at the Pontians, the Czechs laugh at the Slovaks, the Russians laugh at the Ukrainians, the French laugh at the Belgians, the Dutch also laugh at the Belgians, and of course, we all laugh rather nervously at the Germans. And that's another huge topic, German humor, um, which I could go into if you want. Um, I don't know who you find 
stupid who your stupid outsider is, and I doubt that you'll be able to say in public who your stupid outsider is. But the logic of ethnic humor is the identification of a stupid outsider. The flip side of that is the identification of a clever outsider who's also an outsider. So most anti-Semitic jokes are jokes about the Jew as outsider, as clever outsider. Also Anglo-Scottish jokes uh, are traditionally the Scots as mean, clever and mean, as opposed to the anti-Irish jokes, which are the, the stupid outsider. So the way in which you mark, as it were, the territory of your culture is by identifying stupid outsiders and clever outsiders. This corresponds to a definition of, of humor that goes a long way back. Another philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, um, said that laughter is a feeling of sudden glory. Sudden glory, where I find another person ridiculous and I laugh at their expense. So this sort of humor would work. If somebody comes into the seminar late, they trip up, they fall on their face, we laugh at them, right? That's laughter as a feeling of superiority. And a lot of humor is, is, is like that. Um, what do you do with ethnic humor? What do you do with racist humor? This must be analyzed, I think. It must be simply not simply prohibited through some, some notion of political correctness, but must be analyzed. Um, I can't explain this fully here, but I've got a theory about this, which is to say that um, ethnic humor, racist humor, sexist humor, are reactionary, and in their untruth, if you like, they tell us important truths about who we are, right? Insofar as someone like me, as an exemplary, you know, white, left-wing philosophy professor, anti-racist, anti-sexist, I might find myself being told a racist joke and refusing to laugh, but internally registering the logic of that. So it's a way of, as it were, realizing how that, say, racism marks your being, even when you don't want to laugh. The way I put this is that, is that racist humor reveals us to be people that we'd frankly rather not be. And that's interesting. Another important theorist of humor that you will have heard of, I guess, Freud. Freud's early idea about humor was that humor jokes were the return of the repressed. So what happens in jokes is the repressed elements in society bubble to the surface. Um, the one thing people who haven't read Freud's book about jokes know about the book is it's not funny. It's not true, it's full of great gags actually. And Freud was a collector of jokes. And uh... but let me turn to something closer to home for you, perhaps. As some of you might know to your cost, I've got no idea whether this is the case at Google. Humor is being employed as a management tool by consultants. Imagine, if you will, a company called Humor Solutions International. Such humor consultants want to show how humor can produce greater cohesion amongst the workforce and thereby increased, increase efficiency and productivity. This is beautifully caught in the slogan. I'm not making this up. I, I found this. The slogan, laughter loves company and companies love laughter. Right? Now, management consultants refer to this as structured fun. Right? Structured fun, which includes innovations like Inside Out Day, where all employees are asked to wear their clothes inside out. Silly Hat Day, which rather speaks for itself. Or slap the boss around the face with a wet fish day. I just made that one up, actually. <laughs> now, despite, despite the sort of bonhomie that this might inspire, it's difficult not to be cynical about these sorts of endeavors. Uh, the question is about structured fun, is who's structuring the fun and for what end? Who's structuring the fun and for what end? This sort of structured fun, I think, is a sort of compulsory happiness. It's one of the ways in which Employers are regulating employees' private lives, as it were, through things like fun and humor. You become part of the company by laughing together, engaging in structured fun. But this is, let me tell you a story. I was staying in Atlanta recently in January 
at a huge hotel. I had occasion to observe some structured fun from my breakfast table. In one of the vast, anonymous, carpeted, windowless suites that pepper every large hotel in the United States, 50 people from the same company were engaged in collective hopscotch, frisbee, and kickball. It was quite a sight. Much yelping and clapping was to be heard. The very soundtrack to happiness, I pondered. But looking at the sweating, slightly desperate faces of mostly overweight grown-ups, one felt almost moved to tears. After breakfast, I found a huddle of employees standing outside, resolutely smoking in the Georgian January, January drizzle. Smoking is sort of anti-right. Communities of smokers form, form as ways of, as it were, being outside the space of the company. I was enormously reassured, and they felt, because they felt just as cynical about the whole business as I did. One of them said to me they didn't want to appear to be a bad sport or a party pooper, and that's why they went along with it. Also, he concluded they weren't really offered a choice, and there was no other structured fun, nothing. And this reveals something, I think, interesting. Um, there is a vitally subversive feature of humor in the workplace. Namely, as much as humor consultants might try and formalize fun for the benefit of the company, where the comic punchline and the economic bottom line might be seen to blend, such fun is always capable of being ridiculed by uh, informal, unofficial relations amongst employees, by back chat, by salacious gossip. Anyone who's worked in an office, anyone who's worked in a factory, will know how the most scurrilous and usually, op usually obscene stories, songs, and cartoons about the management circulate. Uh, they're the very bread and butter of survival. Humor might well be a management tool, but it's also a tool against the management. And I very much hope that such things take place at Google. So there is a sort of interesting phenomenon here. There's a way in which uh, workplaces will be structured along like, practices of humor, but there's still a way in which that can be subverted and ridiculed informally at the edges of the corporation in terms of what you'll say privately, in terms of the mostly sort of obscene you know, gossip and salacious chit chat and gags about people. And that's also a way in which humor functions. Laughter is contagious. Think about the phenomenon of giggling. Giggling is a very interesting phenomenon. It's a physiological phenomenon that you usually try to suppress. Think of giggling in the context of a, a too formal talk like this one, right? If you're giggling, say, in school or something, you can barely contain it, and it hurts. Giggling really hurts. One might say that the, sh the simple telling of a joke recalls us to what is shared in our everyday practices. It makes explicit what is implicit in our social life. To this extent, uh, there's an interesting story to be told here about, about humor. Um, why I chose the theme of humor rather than the comic and jokes is that the, the word humor goes back to ancient medicine, the doctrine of the four humors um, in, in Galen and the rest. The idea of humor as something jocular, as something funny, begins in a time and place. It begins in the English language at the end of the 17th century. Before that, you would have said, like as Ben Johnson's play, Every Man and His Humor, from the early 17th century, was just as it were, your humor was your disposition, the way you were feeling. Humor as something funny is a late 17th century innovation. And that's why there's this constant linking of the English with humor because it's something that begins in the English language at a certain point in time. There's a lot more to say about that. The first theorist of humor was an aristocrat called Shaftesbury. And he wrote in 1709 a book called Census Communis, a theory, an essay on the freedom of wit and humor. So Census Communis, common sense or sociability. So for, for Shaftesbury, humor is a way in which we express our sociability, our being together. So humor reveals the depths of what we share. But crucially, it does this not through the clumsiness of a, of a theoretical description, but more quietly, practically, and discreetly. Laughter suddenly breaks out in a line for the bus, 
or watching Hillary Clinton give a speech, or when someone farts in an elevator, or indeed if Hillary Clinton farted in an elevator. But that's another story. The hu humor here is an every exemplary practice. It's an exemplary practice because it is something every day, absolutely ordinary, that invites us to become spectators on our lives. And to that extent, it invites us to become philosophers. So my interest in humor is, is a philosophical interest in, in telling jokes, in looking at the world from this Martian perspective, we take a philosophical view of the world. That's to say, I mean, people will say that you know, philosophy is unworldly or abstract. And one of the reasons for being interested in, in humor is to say, well, look, here is a practice, an actually existing social practice, which people do all the time. And they're doing something philosophical with it. They're looking at the world that they inhabit and imagining it some other way. Right? Um, and this is why Wittgenstein, to quote him again, said that he could imagine a book of philosophy that would be entirely written in the form of jokes. He didn't do this. <laughs> he wrote the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which begins with, you know, the world is all that is the case, which isn't exactly a gag, and ends with, you know, what cannot be said must be passed over in silence, which doesn't exactly get the ribs tickling. But you, maybe you get the point. Um, the extraordinary thing about humor is that it returns us to common sense. It returns us to our basic sociability by distancing us from it. Humor familiarizes us with a... Uh, a common world to its miniature strategies of defamiliarization. It reveals what we share, but also, crucially, as I've tried to emphasize, it can change the situation that we inhabit. So humor isn't just about census communists, common sense, it's also about what we might call dissensus communists, an experience of dissent. Um, at its most powerful saying, in the insanely punning dialogues between Chico and Groucho Marx, or in the best bits of Monty Python. Humor is a paradoxical form of speech that defeats our expectations, producing laughter with its verbal inversions, contortions, and explosions. Let me end by telling you two jokes. Um, these are two of my favorite jokes. Maybe I won't tell you the second. I'll see about the nun joke if I'm feeling bold. But the first joke is, is Groucho Marx, um, one of Groucho Marx's favorite jokes. Uh, a man goes to a psychoanalyst because he's lost the will to live. And he sees the psychoanalyst for a number of, number of meetings. It goes on and he's entirely miserable. Nothing can be done for him. And then at the end of a session, um, the psychoanalyst says to the, the guy, says, well, you know, um, I know what you should do tonight. In town, uh, the world's funniest comedian is, is, is playing, he's performing in town, Grok. I urge you to go and see Grok, and when you see Grok, you'll feel better. And the man stands up, the patient stands up, says nothing, walks towards the door. And the, the analyst says, oh, by the way, what, what is your name? He says, I am Grok. Right. Now, what that reveals is the fact that the... Uh, there's like a splitting in the self that happens with humor, right? This, this takes us to another line of thought, which I'd be happy to, to go into if you like. Um, in the best gags, I think, well, there's a gag that, that, that Freud liked to tell, uh, which is a man is condemned to be hanged. And on the morning of his execution, he walks into the courtyard and he's got the gallows ahead of him, leaves the cell, he's got the gallows ahead of him awaiting death. He looks up at the sky and says, well, the week's beginning nicely. Right? Well, the week's beginning nicely. Now, Freud says, what's funny about that, that gag? What's funny about that gag, we <laughs> didn't find it funny, is that, the, is that the condemned man looks at himself from outside of himself and finds himself ridiculous. He laughs at himself. So there is this functioning humor where I look at myself from outside myself and I find myself a source of risibility. The best humor is like that. I, 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 do, I engage in a splitting within myself, like Grok. I am Grok, I'm the world's funniest comedian, and I've lost the world to live. And those two things together. The last joke is going to be about <clears throat> bears. Um, another feature of humor is the inversion, the, the inversion 
of the relationship between the human and the animal. A lot of gags play with that um, by either reducing humans to an animal level or raising animals to a human level. And here's one example. There's a, um, there's a bear. No, no, there's a hunter. There's a hunter. Uh, a hunter in the, in the woods. And he's in the woods and he's, he's hunting. He's got a gun. Um, and he comes to a clearing in the woods. And he waits there. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The sun's at a certain angle. He waits there. He, he's got his gun poised and cocked. And this bear comes running out of the woods. Whoa, huge, huge, huge grizzly bear. Runs towards him. He shoots and he misses. The bear grabs hold of him, flips him over, and viciously sodomizes him. It's awful, awful situation. Um, so understandably, the man is a little bit upset, a little bit peeved, we might say. Um, so that he goes back to the, the town and buys another gun. Three o'clock in the afternoon, <coughs> same place, in the clearing, with his gun, waiting. Sun's in the right position, he's waiting. And the bear comes running out into the clearing again. He takes his gun, shoots, and misses for a second time. Bear grabs hold of him, flips him over, same thing. And he's absolutely furious, you know, as you'd imagine, having been doubly sodomized by that. I don't know how many of you have been. <laughs> but it's, it's not pleasant, let me, let me tell you that. And <laughs> and then he goes, he says, I, he says, I'm going to get this bear if it's the last thing I do. He goes back to the city, gets an AK-47 assault rifle. Right? Comes back to the same spot, it's AK-47, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Sun's at the right angle. He's sitting there waiting at the edge of the clearing. And uh, 3 o'clock, the bear emerges, running towards him, huge grizzly bear. And he takes the AK-47 assault rifle and unbelievably he misses for a third time. The bear comes over to him, puts his arm around his shoulder and says, look, this isn't really about hunting, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and so what you have in that, the incongruity in that gag is the, the animal becomes human and, and one laughs. When you flip that around and the human becomes animal, say for example, in, um, we give the strangest books to children, right? Uh, Gulliver's Travels is uh, you usually just give the first two books of Gulliver's Travels. The fourth book of Gulliver's Travels is about the, the voyage to the land of, of the Huynims. And the Huynims are talking animals, horses, talking horses. Uh, Swift's point is that if you believe the human being is a rational animal, then why not a talking horse? And in that situation, the humans are called yahoos. Yahoos, that's where the idea of yahoo comes from. I shouldn't give advertising to yahoo, I guess. The, uh, and the yahoos are sitting in trees, shitting on, on the ground and the rest. And in those situations, that, that doesn't really invite laughter as a sort of disgust with the species. So the crucial aspect of humor is this human-animal split. I could go on, but I won't go on. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Should we do some questions? Sir? So I have, a, I have a question that's maybe not such a philosophical question, but maybe more a scientific one. Right. Um, <clears throat> so why is, like, if you watch different comedians, different comedians could take the same material, and some, some, you know, by the delivery and by precisely the timing yeah. of, like, what exactly they say, like, they could make something much more funnier than it ordinarily would be. Mm -hmm. And so what, why is timing important? Oh, it, it, and timing is everything, right? Timing is everything. But it, it, it's a, there's a wonderful film. Uh, it's an English film called Funny Bones uh, by Peter Chelson from 1994. Strongly, strongly recommend it. It's one of the, it's, it's a performance with the aging Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis is the, sort of the, sort of the comic that's become monster. A little bit like in the, the Scorsese film. What's the Scorsese film with De Niro? <laughs> yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and he's a successful comic, and his son wants to be a comic, and he's unsuccessful. Um, and at the end of the film, he explains to his son, look, 
it's like this. Um, there are people. There are people who aren't funny. Right? There are people who can talk funny, who get people to write gags for them. He says, "I'm one of those people." And then there are people with funny bones. Those people with funny bones, whatever material they have, you'll find funny. I think genuine comics have some like funny bones. So there are people who have bad material that you'll laugh at because they're funny. By virtue of what are they funny, it's unclear. Uh, but there are. I've done these kind of studies to see like why, like no, on a on a micro level, like why something is funnier, like. When well, it, it's not, I mean, there's, it's interesting, there is, there's a lot of interest in, as it were, locating the, you know, the, the part of the brain or whatever that, that generates humor or whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, we might find that if we did, it still wouldn't affect what we find, what we find funny. And it wouldn't change this issue of timing, right? So a great comic, like a great singer, has the right timing, knows where to, where to pause, and it's also something that you learn. I mean, something that joke telling is something that certain cultures have. You know, Jewish culture, in particular, is part of you know, part of what it means to uh, to be part of Jewish culture is to be able to tell tell stories, right? to tell gags, to be funny. And that means you sort of learn that timing. You learn that uh, there might be a uh, there might be a sort of a, a physiological <coughs> brain basis for that. But in a sense, that's not what's interesting. For me, what's interesting is, 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 is joking and humor as cultural fact. Mm -hmm. Something like that. But the idea of funny bones is just an interesting one. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you for having um, me. So, so a rabbi and a priest, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, so I have two tell questions. It, tell it, tell it, tell no, it. I, I don't really have one in mind. <laughs> Um, I have two questions. One of them is sort of about this like uh, issue of offensive jokes yeah. that, that you uh, brought up. And so I have told and heard many offensive jokes. And um, <laughs> when I was younger, I always thought that like, you know, why shouldn't I be able to tell them? Like this idea of political correctness yeah. is, is really oppressive yeah. and, and restricts my speech. And really these jokes sort of mock the, the status quo of, yeah. of society imposing on me this idea of what I can and cannot say. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, more recently, I've been thinking about the value of that imposition yeah. for society as, like, telling you, like, look, uh, you can't make a joke about Jewish people, say, for instance, mm -hmm. to, to use my people as an example. Um, <laughs> uh, because, you know, because the, the, you know, not saying that is the vehicle of progress, right? Yeah. It puts us all in this mindset that you talk about where you hear the joke and you think about it for a second and you're like, well, I kind of wish I didn't hear it. Um, so I was wondering uh, if you could comment on like the situation of uh, you know offensive jokes with respect to political correctness because it's not just like rebellion against um, it's not just commenting on an outsider in that case it's also commenting on an insider yeah right and like what's going on in your own society uh, the jokes on the insider I mean it's a it's a very complex issue and it's sort of got it's got more complex I think in the last few years I mean there's a lot more you know, offensive humor out there, which is, is, is playing with that, playing with that limit in, it's not like Sarah Silverman or something like that, there's something that's playing with that in a way that is, you know, it's questionable. One thing's for sure is that prohibition won't work. If you prohibit jokes, then you're just gonna make, you're gonna send that thing underground that's gonna, you know, appear in a, in a, in a different way. That can often be good for jokes. I mean, totalitarian regimes are great for humor. You know, um, one thing I'll say for totalitarianism is it's very good for humor. So, you know, the old Czech joke, Czech, the old Czechoslovak jokes of, you know, why do Czech secret policemen go around in groups of three, one who can read, one who can write, and one to keep an eye on the two dangerous intellectuals. Right? <laughs> those, now, when, when you've got a democratic regime, that possibility of humor evaporates. Right? So, so if you like, humor works much better in re repressive regimes because you can laugh at those in power. The issue of offensive humor, I mean, prohibition's not going to do it. The issue of who tells the joke is, is, is crucial. Like, who's speaking? So, you know, if it's a, a Jewish comic telling, as it were, classic anti-Semitic jokes, but doing that in such a way that flips the thing around, or same thing with you know, African-American comics, then, but that can easily be, it, it, it's, it's, you've got to give a very contextual response. I mean, 
the rabbi priest, I mean, my, do you know this one about the, um, you've got the rabbi and the priest on a train, they're in an old you know, railway compartment, and um, old fashioned railway compartment, there's, a, there's a, a rabbi and a priest, and the, uh, the, um, the, after a few miles, the priest says to the rabbi, says, you're, you're a rabbi, right? You're, you're a Jew. He says, yes, I am. He says, is, 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 is it true that, um, that you people don't eat pork? He says, yeah, it's true we don't eat pork. He says, but <clears throat> have, you ever, have you ever tried it? He says, actually, yes, I, I did try it. He says, did you like it? He says, it was very nice. Silence descends, a few miles pass. Then the rabbi says to the priest, says, you're a Catholic priest, right? Yeah, I'm a Catholic priest. Is it true that you people can't have sex? He says, um, it's true, we, we can't have sex. He says, but just between us, it won't go beyond this compartment. Have you ever tried it? And the priest says, no, I haven't. And the rabbi says, it's better than pork. <laughs> so that's a that's a you know a lovely two step. There's a lot of gags like that. Now that depends on who's who's saying it. You know, I think the line is shifting on offensive humour. I don't think people know where it is anymore. You know, and I think it, it's very easy to overstep the line. And we're going to be in for a lot more of it if Obama gets the candidacy. You know, in terms of what what's going to the issues of, of racist humor in this country and how that's going to be handled. Prohibition is not going to work. So how is that going to be managed? I don't know. Uh, and my second question, yeah. is I hope it's quicker, uh, is some, some classic like British humor, something like the British run of The Office or yeah. something like Curb Your Enthusiasm. It doesn't really seem to fit into the, not all of it at least, seem to fit into this model of, of pleasure or comic relief necessarily yeah. because actually I find myself watching it for the awkwardness of the moment. Yes. Right? And that's yes. not, it's, it feels almost like jazz humor, like the, the delayed resolution of, yeah. of, of it actually makes it all the more pleasurable for me. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how that fits your, your various models of, of humor. Copy enthusiasm I don't know as well, but The Office certainly, I mean, the, the, I think The Office is, it's a beautiful example of, you know, it's comedy of recognition firstly. You know, we know what an office is, here is an office, you know. And, um, and people that work in offices will, you know, rec particularly in England, will recognize exactly the structures that are in play, the funny boss that's not funny, they have to laugh at and all of that. But <clears throat> I think that the office is a good example, particularly the second series, of, of, a, sort of a change of situation. That, as it were, the, the humor becomes, becomes painful. So, in a sense, the so for me, the, the essence of great humor is an experience of something like pain, right? Any, any humor can produce pleasure. That's easy. But it's a pleasure which produces a sort of a pain, which is really interesting. Because then you begin to really question uh, the world that you inhabit. And, and those, the second series of The, the Office, when he, he gives the motivational speech to, he gets this gig doing a motivational speech to people at, um, I found I just couldn't, um, I was on the sofa behind cushions with that. I mean, there was that, and it's that pain which is essential. So I think the, uh, the, the great comic is someone that can, can handle that pain. So in a sense, there's something deeply masochistic about great humor. And the, and the comic is the sadist in that sense, who knows how to handle the punishment. Think of Lenny Bruce. I mean, Lenny Bruce is, Lenny Bruce is assaulting his audience, right? But it's in a way that they, as it were, masochistically they're, in, they're sort of enjoying that pain. But in doing that, you are seeing things in a different way. And I suppose the general point I was trying to make was that that's, that's a philosophical attitude, right? right? Right there. You don't need to study Hume or Locke or Wittgenstein. To, you, with humor, you can see how that thing works. Thanks for the question. Uh, can one acquire a sense of humor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> why, why, why did you ask? <laughs> well, I, I know some people have a great sense of humor and some yes. don't. So I wonder if you can actually. Well, <clears throat> people that don't have a sense of humor are often mad. Uh, my wife is a, is, a, is, a, is a shrink, and she works up at Mount Sinai with psychotic patients. And if you spend time with psychotics, if any of you have, one of the features is that they, don't, they have no sense of humor. There's no, there's no laughter at all. 
So they will explain their theory of the cosmos, which usually has some relationship to God and divine emanations and a, a whole cosmology. And there's nothing funny about it at all. So what you're trying to do, one of the things you're trying to do with a psychotic is to get them to laugh. Um, but it's not just psychotics that are, that are unfunny, right? The, the sense in which um, I think we live in cultures. We live in, or we live in a culture where our, our, our narcissism is such that we want everything to reflect back uh, our image, everything to reflect back the image of our own gl greater glory. And that's an entirely humorless universe. And the point of humor would be to puncture that in, in different ways. So one can acquire humor, but some people aren't going to get it. And, it, and, and, then, and contextually, it's incredibly various, right? If you, if you look at, I don't know where you're, where you're from, but the... Russia. Russia, okay, Russia has an incredibly powerful tradition of very dark humor, right? Particularly Moscovite humor. It's extraordinary, you know, linguistic performance, which if you try to translate that, just, just doesn't work. You can acquire it, but... Some people don't, I guess, as well, <laughs> would be my life. Hi, uh, just a quick question. Do you think the kind of the, the intellect or the brain is kind of the enemy of humor in the sense that... Say again? The, the intellect is the enemy of humor? In the intellect is the enemy of humor. In the sense that you, know, you have to be kind of a bit drunk to appreciate some humor or you have to be drunk to save some jokes or just in the sense that you, know, <clears throat> you have humor at different levels. You have like, you know, very raw humor, like, you know, the fart in the elevator, which usually generates a lot more explosive laughter than yeah. like a refined joke, like something, you know, Hillary Clinton jokes that you mentioned. That's a good question. The, um, because one, one way of looking at humor is in terms of, it's the revenge of the body. It's the, it's the body's revenge, right? So we, we live with this, you know, we have these compartmentalized, ordered bodies that we hygienically, you know, cleanse and, you know, depilate and the rest. And uh, remember In Ingmar Bergman, <laughs> Ingmar Bergman, the great Swedish director who died last year, said as he was getting older was asked, are there any, any things you regret about getting older? He said, he said yes, involuntary flatulence. And, <laughs> and I won't tell you the story I was gonna tell you in relationship to that because it's too embarrassing. But, the, but that would be the revenge of the body, right? And there are moments like that. Um, and for example, the great Russian theorist of humor, Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin, who was, as it were, an exile from thrown out by the Stalinist regime, that was really his defense of humor, his defense of uh, uh, a sort of populist idea of humor, which he thought was this eruption of the body right, against the mind. There's some truth to that. But also, there are traditions of humor which are powerfully intellectual. I mean, Jewish humor is, is one. Jewish humor is often about you know, deeply intellectual manipulations of in, inversions, which require almost, you know, sort of a logical uh, frame of mind. Do you think that, you know, appreciating one, of, one kind of humor is going to kind of make you less receptive to the other kind? Like, is there like a trade-off? Do you think some people, or do you think people who have, like, good humor understand both kinds of humor? Equally? I think they hopefully can understand both, but again, that's contextual. Like, for example, English, English humor, the tradition of English humor is for the most part linguistic and intellectual. It's cognitive. It's about forms of incongruity or something like, you know, Monty Python would be a good example of that. Speech becomes absurd. It becomes twisted, turned around. French traditions of humor, Italian traditions of humor are much more physical. Right? There's a tradition of sort of physical comedy in, in Italy, which is different. Now, you can view both, but you've got to put both in their context. And both have their both have their worth, right? I, I prefer, for me, I I I prefer I prefer sort of intellectual forms of wit. I find those more powerful. But thank you. Sure. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but okay. I do want to thank Simon very much for coming out. I really appreciate everyone's questions. Thank um, you. I think we do have a few minutes and you're going to stick around and, and sign some books. So if you want your, uh, your book signed, you can uh, come on up. So again, thank you very much for coming out to the, the program. Thank you for listening.